We're going to Romans chapter 1, if you'd like to find it. Romans chapter 1, and uh, today we're going to have science class as it ought to be. And that is from a biblical perspective, from God's viewpoint, God's worldview. Um, it ought to be that students leave science class saying, Amen, Hallelujah, Glory to God. That's how it ought to be. It's not, is it? Anyone ever attend a class like that? <laughs> Everybody finished up with a word of thanksgiving to God. But that's what it ought to be. And we're going to see God's glory in his creation. We're going to begin in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. It says, For the invisible things of him, the Lord, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. It's not Mother Nature. It's the creation of the world being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everyone on planet Earth clearly understands there is a God. They understand his eternal power and his Godhead, according to this verse, and they are inexcusable. So, we're going to look today at icons of creation, evidence for the creator from his creation. Now, how in the world do you fit all that into, you know, just a short time? We're not going to. But I want to just say most of the photographs in this presentation were taken by Brother Cloud. Uh, we're going to look at two trilobites that are in his collection. He took from the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. And uh, we're really just looking at a number of uh, really just two out of 35 icons of creation that he has in that book, which I've mentioned many times over the course of this series. Um, other icons of creation in this book are the living cell, the human eye, the human brain, blood clotting, the red blood cell, the bombardier beetle, the flying feather, bird migration, bird song, the flagellum motor, which you have in every one of your cells, and then there's the biomimetics uh, uh, icon of creation as well. So we'll, uh, all of that's available in the book, but today we're going to just look at two. In fact, we're going to spend most of our time on this first one, the monarch butterfly, and we're still not going to do it justice, but I, I hope that when you see it, you will come away glorifying the Lord. First off, though, proving the existence of God from the design of life is a scriptural thing. Look in verse 20, if you will. Uh, it says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Notice the two things, even his eternal power and Godhead. And so uh, all of this is seen from creation. And that's what we want to look at some. Also, Hebrews 3, 4, every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Sir Isaac Newton said, in the absence of any other proof, the thumb alone would convince me of God's existence. Just every one of us has a thumb, as far as I can tell, and uh, that that alone, just the ability of that thumb and the study of it, there must be a God, he said. And he was an eminent scientist. If an individual cannot clearly see God in creation, as Romans 1.20 says, it's because the mind has been darkened through rebellion. Notice 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. It mentions the God, little g, God of this world. That's, of course, a reference to Satan. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Darken through rebellion. The obvious design in creation has convinced many scientists that there is a God. Michael Denton, whose doctorate is in molecular uh, genetics, said, it is, is it really credible that random processes could have constructed a reality which excel in every sense 
anything produced by the intelligence of man. He said it's the sheer universality of perfection. The fact that everywhere we look, to whatever depth we look, we find an elegance and ingenuity of an absolutely transcendent quality, which so mitigates against the idea of chance, which, of course, Darwin uh, and evolution count on chance. He went on and said, alongside the level of ingenuity and complexity exhibited by the molecular machinery of life, even our most advanced artifacts appear clumsy. What God has made is so beautiful. It is so magnificent. So let's get into the monarch butterfly to begin with. And the monarch butterfly is a premier icon of creation. Every detail of this amazing creature points to an almighty creator. We're going to look at, oh, I think about six different details. First off, metamorphosis, uh, which is a word speaking of change, uh, transformation, this amazing transformation. It's, I, I think this is a, as we look at this, we're seeing a great example of what Christ does to a sinner. He takes a sinner who just thinks wickedly, talks wickedly, lives for himself, makes a mess of his life and the lives of others, and transforms that person into a servant of the Lord who wants to pray and praise God, loves the house of God, the people of God, the word of God. That takes a mighty transformation. Well, that's metamorphosis. The uh, butterfly goes through a four-stage process called metamorphosis. You've got the egg, then there's the larva, or the caterpillar stage, the pupa, or the chrysalis stage, and then there is the adult. The egg is where everything begins. It begins life as a tiny, brilliantly designed egg that the female butterfly attaches to the exact type of vegetation needed by the caterpillar. So it, it hatches, and right away, there's breakfast, waiting for it uh, to consume. And my, does it consume it. But more about that in a moment. In the case of the monarch butterfly, the plant is always the milkweed. The female is equipped to find the right plant in the right condition. We'll talk about that later. The special glue she produces holds the egg securely in all types of weather. And some sort of a super glue, right? We could sure manufacture that and use it. Well, it becomes a caterpillar. The creature that emerges from the egg is a larva or caterpillar. It is an eating machine that increases its weight 3,000 times in 20 days. No, you didn't read that incorrectly. It doubles in size about every 12 hours. Watch it happening. Right away, what does it do? <laughs> munch, 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 munch. All right. 3,000 times its size in 20 days. That's the equivalent of a human baby increasing from 3.6 kilograms to 10.8 kilograms in less than three weeks. Uh-oh, <laughs> would you like to have, ladies, would you like to have a, a little baby like that, growing that fast? Uh, well, that's how much this thing grows and so quickly. The monarch caterpillar eats only milkweed. Interestingly enough, it's poisonous to other insects. So that it sequesters this poisonous substance and it retains it through the metamorphosis, metamorphosis process all the way into the butterfly stage. We'll get to in a moment. For this reason, the butterfly is protected from being eaten by predators because they will be poisoned, so they know better than to eat the thing. 
The caterpillar has three pairs of true legs and then up to six pairs of prolegs. The prolegs have rings of tiny hooks called crochets that help the caterpillar grip the leaves and stems of plants. So the crochets are not actually legs, but they kind of look like it to us. The creature's brain and nervous system control the extremely complex coordinated movement of its legs. As the caterpillar grows, it casts off its outer skin layer five times. Maybe some of us have seen uh, a, a snake skin that's been shed. It's called molting. Or perhaps you've seen a huntsman skin that is shed. It's very interesting to see that. Um, that's a process in a number of God's creations called molting. Well, it's the same here. And it does this on five occasions and it's necessary to accommodate its rapidly increasing size. Every part of this process is exceedingly complex. There are sensors in the skin of the caterpillar that detect the amount of pressure or strain being put on the skin. And when that is too great, they send a signal to the brain, which then releases a hormone that causes molting. When the caterpillar molts, said Jules Poirier, if I'm saying his name correctly, if it's even a him, uh, when it molts, it sheds its entire head capsule with its six eye lenses and spinneret. Thus, there must be four or five different head capsules made, each one being bigger to accommodate the growing caterpillar. During the caterpillar stage, imaginal cell clusters appear at various locations in its body, and these contain the genetic information for the future butterfly. All right, the next stage is the pupa. When it has grown to the right size, the caterpillar finds a proper location to enter the pupa stage. It uses its eyes and other complex sensors to locate the right place then it spins a silk pad and hangs from this by its prolegs. After a day or two, the caterpillar molts the final time, but this time it forms something completely different. At this stage, the mysterious cremaster appears. This is an absolutely essential step since it has been hanging by its prolegs but these will be shed with the final molting. The prolegs are going to be shed. So this mysterious cremaster appears. When the skin of the molt is pushed to the top, a hole is uncovered, and through this, the stalk-like cremaster protrudes and attaches itself to the silk pad. Here's what it looks like in detail. On the outer end is a bulb with microscopic hooks to facilitate the attachment. After the cremaster is attached, the caterpillar rotates clockwise three times to thrust the cremaster hooks deeper into the pad. It then removes the prolegs from the pad and convulses to cast off the old outer skin, which is necessary so the butterfly will not be deformed and so it can exit the pupa. The appearance of the cremaster at just the right time and its successful insertion into the silk pad is essential for the survival of the butterfly. And it accomplishes this amazing task when it's blind, has no external sensory organs. It's programmed into the DNA to do this. After a few hours, the pupal skin hardens inside the pupa Caterpillar's body and organs and even its very cells dissolve into a cellular liquid referred to as soup. Not any soup you and I would like to eat, but you get the point. It just dissolves. Cell death is programmed. If you kill the wrong cells, you're in deep trouble. It's very carefully engineered. You're going to save some of the cell population, so you have to know where you're going to end up before you start. This is pointing to a designer. The soup reorganizes itself into a beautiful butterfly. 
When it is ready to emerge, it taps onto the front of the pupa with its legs, and the pupal skin breaks and opens in front like a door. If the pupa weren't carefully designed, it would be impossible for the delicate butterfly to emerge. And here you can see them emerging from the pupa. Doesn't look anything like a caterpillar, does it? The butterfly exits and suspends itself in order to pump the veins of its wings full of fluid to unfold them. It also expertly joins the two segments of its proboscis to form one sucking tube. So it's got two segments and it puts them together and makes one sucking tube out of it. It knows how to do all of this even though it has never existed in this form before, yet time and time again, every one of them does it. <laughs> the caterpillar has 16 short legs, the butterfly has six long articulated legs. The caterpillar has a chewing mouth and a stomach to digest vegetative matter the butterfly has a sucking mouth, a drinking tube, that's the proboscis, and a stomach to digest nectar rather than vegetative matter. This is the metamorphosis we're talking about, the complete transformation. The caterpillar has six simple eyes that see only in black and white. The butterfly has two compound eyes that see in color. The caterpillar has no reproductive ability. The butterfly has complex reproductive organs. The caterpillar crawls. The butterfly flies. The caterpillar is creepy and undesirable. The butterfly is beautiful and delightful. The entire process of metamorphosis had to be genetically programmed from the very beginning of this creature's existence. The caterpillar could not have evolved into a butterfly step by step because it has no reproductive capability without going through the complete process. The pupa stage could not survive without complete genetic pre-programming. Every stage is incredibly complex and fully interrelated with every other stage. By its very nature, metamorphosis is an all or nothing proposition. Throughout biological history, its success has hinged upon the immediate availability of a full set of instructions, including genes, proteins, and the developmental program required to integrate them. Once you're committed to the chrysalis stage, there's no going back. You have to complete the transition. A caterpillar that's equipped to go 10%, 25% through metamorphosis is no way through metamorphosis. You have to recreate adult legs, adult antenna, antennae, uh, adult eyes. You have to change the shape of the brain and the connections to the organs. You have to reformat the gut. If you get the eyes right but the gut wrong, it's a failure as a butterfly. If you get the wings right and the legs right but the muscles don't attach, that butterfly is going nowhere. It's dead. You begin to see the depths of the problem. Metamorphosis, if it came into existence at all by an undirected process, had to have done so in one fell swoop. To create a process like metamorphosis, you need a totally different type of cause that under, than undirected natural selection, something that could see a distant target, keep that target in focus, and provide all the resources necessary to hit the bullseye on the first shot. The only cause that could accomplish this is an intelligent agent. Now let's look at migration. One variety of the monarch butterfly flies 4,000 to 4,800 kilometers from Canada, northern USA, to central Mexico. That generation that flies to Mexico is referred to as the Methuselah generation. Who's the oldest man who ever lived? According to the book of Genesis 5, it is Methuselah, lived to be nearly 1,000 years old. Well, these don't, but it's programmed to live for six to eight months instead of the few weeks that is typical for a monarch. Migration takes about two months and the butterflies overwinter, it's called overwintering in trees, 
in mountainous area with millions of them congregated in a few acres. We're talking about in Mexico, a particular mountainous area within just a few acres. You will see, as you can see here, if you can notice on the photo there is just millions of little butterflies. And they return to the same tree where their forebears overwintered generations before they were born. They find this exact location without any guide other than genetic programming. Their forebears, who overwintered the previous year, died long before the Methuselah generation was born. Think of it. They only live about two months or so. And then the, other, the next generation lives a few weeks. How many generations are between every winter? Many, many of them. There's no great-great-great-grandfather to sit down baby monarch and say, now here's what you do. It's just all programmed by God into the DNA. In March, which is the springtime over there, the butterflies leave Mexico and they fly north for some distance, mate, lay eggs, and die. The caterpillars hatch, go through metamorphosis. Then the new butterflies unerringly continue the migration north. They know exactly where they are on the migration route and they know exactly where they need to go. It's the second or third generation that completes the migration and arrives back in the northern areas from where their forebears originated. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Scientists have found that the butterfly uses a combination of a sun compass, a skylight cues, a circadian uh, clock, and magnetic sensing to maintain its direction. But understanding these things to some degree does nothing to explain how such breathtakingly complex biological equipment and such a process could evolve. Just because we can explain a little bit of it doesn't mean that we actually can explain uh, how that all got to, to evolve as they try to tell us uh, the evolutionists. The Secular Monarch Butterfly website uses the term magic to describe the butterfly's life cycle and migration because it's so mystifying and inexplicable by evolutionary terms. You and I know it's not magic, it is divine, it's God. Look with me now at the butterfly's beauty. Butterflies are so beautiful, they have been called flying flowers. Next time you see a butterfly, maybe you could just say, Lord, I praise you for that flying flower. Every one of the 20,000 species have different color patterns, and every one of them have different shaped wings. Ronald Bonder said, if I was the greatest artist in the world, there's no way I could come up with all of these patterns. Well, the greatest artist is the one who did. Look at some of these colors and some of these patterns. And every one of them different. I love just noticing the different shapes of some of these wings, let alone the colors. That's an iridescent one there. This one looks more like a zebra. And there you have uh, just all these little jut outs in the wings. And notice Again, there's an iridescence to that. In other words, it glows a bit. This one looks like it reminds me of a tiger. Does it remind you of tigers? Again, iridescent, glowing. Just so many, many different shapes and colors to them. And the butterfly's wings are covered with millions of shingle-like overlapping scales which create the colors and patterns. So you've got Lepidoptera, the Latin term for butterflies means scaly. Some colors, like the red and white on these wings, derive from pigmented scales. The iridescent colors, like the deep blue, derive from reflective scales that ingeniously refract a particular wavelength of light. So it shows these luminous colors that seem to change when you look from one angle to another. That's what iridescent means. Like this one. If you were to look at it from over here or over there, uh, it would change or appear to change. 
There are tens of thousands of scales for every square centimeter of wing. Every square centimeter of wing. And each scale was a living cell until a day or two before the butterfly emerged from its pupa. We found by using the electron microscope that there are structures that can have no more variation than, notice how small that is. You know how small a millimeter is. Very, very tiny. If you, that's as small as it gets when you get out your tape measure. And, and the smallest size you'll see on that usually is the millimeter. This is 0. 0.00004 of a millimeter. A wonderful testament to God's design. The reason for this tight tolerance, Dr. Stone says, is the very short wavelengths of visible light. In order to reflect just the right color at every point in the pattern, the scales must be just the right thickness for constructive interference at just that color to occur. The scales also act as tiny solar panels. We think, you know, we've come up with solar uh, electricity uh, fairly recently. We think we're really something. God's had it in existence for 6,000 years. They provide heat to warm the flight muscles of the cold-blooded creature. Notice the butterfly there is almost completely yellow. Let's look at the eyes. Each of the butterfly's compound eyes has 6,000 perfectly shaped and arranged lenses. Remember we said there's two eyes. Compound eye has multiple lenses to it, in this case 6,000. And they're connected, all of them, to the optic nerve, and its brain can decipher 72,000 nerve impulses from the eyes. Its eyes can see every color a human can see, plus ultraviolet light, which is reflected by certain flowers. It's interesting, you and I can't see it, but uh, they found, uh, for example, um, the little flower put out by a cucumber it glows a, just a bright orange. And, and, and the, uh, what do you call the uh, pollen? The pollen is very uh, bright under an ultraviolet light. Well, that butterfly can see it all. And the round shape of the eye provides a field of view that exceeds 180 degrees. Just to refresh your memories, uh, if you were to go like this, you would probably not be able to see both of your eyes. So you've got to bring them forward a little bit. And just looking forward, you can just barely see the, 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 you know, your palms or your hands. And so you do not have 180 degree vision, but it's fairly close. Uh, 360 would be if you could see all the way to the back. <laughs> oh, this thing has uh, eyes that provide a field of view that exceed 180 degrees. So they can sit there pointing that way and they can see way back here. <laughs> so that's amazing. It also can detect light polarization. We won't go into all that, but it's thought to use this ability to determine the direction of the sun, even on cloudy days during migration. And then uh, we already talked about the proboscis. Uh, that is the double-tubed feeding straw that the butterfly uses to draw nectar from flowers. It can either be rolled up for flight and extended, uh, or it can be extended at will. Notice how it's all rolled up so this thing can go flying somewhere. And there are smell and taste sensors at the tip to help guide it to the nectar. That is an amazing thing. In fact, I've got an article I'm going to put on the Evolution website I should call it the creation website um, that, that you know we have. I'm going to put that article on in the next couple of weeks, Lord willing, that is going to talk about our tongues and what our tongues look like um, and, and what they're discovering about how uh, we have uh, the ability to taste and so forth. Well, that's what God's put on the tips of these little proboscis uh, so it can smell and taste and go to the nectar where, where they get their food. Well, there's the antennae. Uh, these complex sensor organs are used to smell flowers and to locate the right milkweed leaves for laying eggs. They're used for balance in flying and for migration. And also, uh, the female's antennae are tipped with red smell sensors that can sense the male's perfume from more than three kilometers away. Imagine that three kilometers away. Uh, 
I mean, from here to your house, John, is only half of that, I'd say. Wouldn't you? Something like that. Three kilometers away. Maybe from here to the Elsinore Motor Lodge, somewhere like that. Maybe more. Now let's return to the place we started, the butterfly's egg. Within this tiny egg is an entire world of genetic information. It contains the instructions for the construction of the caterpillar's body. It contains the instructions to create the intelligence the caterpillar needs to operate all of its organs, to maneuver within its environment, to digest leaves, to avoid predators, to know when and how to molt, to pupate, etc. It contains the instructions for the incredibly complex process of the final molting and formation of the pupa, including the amazing cremester mechanism. It contains the instructions for the death and dissolution of the caterpillar into a biological soup and the reformation of that soup into a beautiful butterfly. It contains the instructions not only to construct the butterfly in all of its mind-boggling complexity, but also to create the butterfly's amazing brain and the intelligence needed to thrive within its environment. It contains the instructions for the bewildering multi-thousand kilometer migration to a place it has never been and in the absence of any earthly guide. It would seem, in fact, that the genetic code within that tiny butterfly egg contains a map of a large part of the earth, and it contains the information for constructing copies of itself. If the butterfly is the product of evolution, then evolution is miraculous and has all the characteristics of Almighty God.